Okay, everybody, why, why? I think yeah. we're ready. We're going to start. Perfect. Um, okay, well, let's just begin by welcoming everybody to another Fresh Start alumni webinar. We brought Hashem had this list again to have Rabbi YY. Um, just as a reminder, it is being live streamed on Rabbi YY's YouTube channel. So if you do ask a question live and your camera is on, it'll be on the YouTube channel. You're welcome to text us questions. You're welcome to ask questions live as well. Um, we have a few questions to uh, get this event started. Um, so again, as always, it's a tremendous chizik being here with all of our alumni. And um, Rabbi YY, thank you for always being there with us, for us. And um, hopefully you can make our Pesach uh, more meaningful. I know we have some questions that came in, but if we can jump right into it, Rabbi YY. Sure. If we could just begin, perhaps with a few minutes, by talking about what Pesach is, and as importantly, what Pesach is not. I think that's... <laughs> Okay, do you want to start share? there? I will. Maybe you want to just share the few questions, and then it could be a good, uh, you know. So I, I mean, it's it's so you know, two other questions that came in that I would begin with, which are, you You're know, I, start I just, with that really heavy one with the orphan. I just okay, want to say can... hi to so many familiar faces. It's so nice to see you all from our recent sessions, from our. Older sessions, it's so nice to see you from a very long time ago, from very current. Every single one of you, I'm looking at you and I'm saying hi to you. It's really special to see you. Thank you for showing up. Really beautiful. Um, Yochan, I'd say start with the one. Thank you also for showing up, Tova. It's my pleasure. I get such chizuk every time I see our, our, I mean, there's faces here that it's just, it's so beautiful to see. And like, I know we're going to have great questions. I see people in the crowd. They're just amazing people, one after another. You're also. Okay. I'm gonna. Thank you. You, you are gonna hold on there. Let's. Let's just. Yeah. Let's just run by why? Why? I just want to make sure that we are. Your spotlight for everyone. Spotlight for everyone. All right. We'll all pin videos. Yes. Continue. Okay. I think you are. Yes, spotlight you started for to say now. two questions. Okay. So I'll, I'll start with the the heavier one again. I I I think. This applies to many people, at least our alumni, and I suspect some people watching. Um, but this is a, a pretty loaded one. I'm an orphan from both of my parents. My journey at Fresh Start was amazing and very healing. With that being said, I still have lots of pain in me, lots of trauma that I don't want to relive, but Pesach does bring up a lot. Until now, it was hard enough. Now both of my parents have passed in the past few years. And I'm the oldest child in the family. I still have a bunch of unmarried siblings. And I'm trying to work through my journey. My spouse is also dealing with a lot, depression, anxiety. And obviously, being the oldest son, I have all the younger siblings come to me for Pesach. I am definitely overwhelmed and freaking out. I feel like I can barely handle myself, my wife, and children. And now I have to do all my siblings with me, which will remind me even more of my Sadarm and my home growing up. Any words of advice would help me. How do I handle all that? I can't even think of it, never mind giving my wife the proper physics she needs to prepare for Yom Tov. Wow. And what you said, the second one? Second one is I'm a 27-year-old, and uh, I don't really enjoy Pesach. There's not much that I enjoy. Um, truthfully, I struggle with many mitzvahs. I seem like a very normal guy. I'm in the Shidduch Parsha. People think I'm a good, good boy. I come from a yeshivish family, but my parents are very strict, and everything is a big deal. Everything is constantly measured just by how more religious can we be at this moment. <laughs> no one seems to see the humanity of the children or what our needs are. How do I handle my parts this Pesach? Wow. Um, and how do I try to survive it? even though I don't want to be like them, but I still have to sit at the Seder. Wow. You know, I think we could just sit with these two questions and breathe into them and meditate on them and embrace them and cultivate them and internalize them. 
and really uh, look at these two questions with a lot of empathy and compassion and love. And, and I'm not exaggerating. What I'm saying is that, you know, sometimes the questions themselves are the profoundest answers. And I want to tell you what I want to explain to you what I mean. Everybody knows that Pesach is a time to ask questions, right? The highlight, or one of the highlights of the Seder is Kan HaBen Shail. Here, the child asks. And this is universal among all the Jewish people. We begin the Seder with the children asking. In fact, our sages teach us that many of the rituals instituted on Pesach at the Seder was to trigger questions, to arouse questions, to inspire and stimulate questions and conversations. And it's interesting that the answers are not so clear. <laughs> like the child asks four questions. Do we give him an answer? I don't know, which answer should take 30 seconds. I don't know, maybe two minutes. It's almost like the answer becomes like a Rabbi YY speech. You know, it goes on and on, an hour, two hours, three hours. At some point, everybody is sleeping, so we don't care anymore about the answer. Like. Why don't we just give four answers to four questions? It seems perhaps that the questions themselves are extremely meaningful and significant. And maybe the difference between a slave and a free person is a slave doesn't ask questions. A slave simply surrenders to the status quo. This is who I am. This is what I have to do. There's no room to put a question mark. There's no room to challenge anything. And in our own lives, we know when I am so wounded to the point that I don't even challenge it anymore. I don't even ask for a better life. I don't even tell myself, you think things can change? You think I can respond differently? You think there's hope for a different type of consciousness? You think there is a way out of my stuckness, of my emotional paralysis, of my Egypt, of my Egyptian bondage? The question itself is a symptom of freedom. The question itself means there's something bothering me. I'm challenging the status quo. So I want to say to both of you at the onset that I think, you know, your questions are so, so important. The first question about, you know, Pesach as an orphan with all of the memories and all of the pain that comes up and the relationship with the siblings and the chizuk and strength that your spouse needs and that you need, right? That's your question. The second question, a different type of question, but all the questions are connected about my parents not seeing my humanity and mitzvahs are generally difficult for me, especially Pesach is difficult for me. You know, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to approach it? And that's what I want to tell you. Honor both of your, honor your questions emotionally. And what that means on a practical level is don't try to fit into somebody else's Pesach. And maybe let's address for a moment, Rabbi Yechidim began the seminar, what is Pesach, what is not Pesach? What is Pesach, what is not Pesach? We call Pesach Zman Cheruseinu, the time of our liberation, of our emancipation. We're celebrating freedom and liberty. Yet, if we can be blunt with each other, and at these seminars and workshops, we try to be blunt with each other, Many people will tell you that Pesach is a time of slavery. <laughs> Pesach is a time of anxiety. Pesach is a time of heightened anxiety. It's almost like, do me a favor, you know, if this is what liberty looks like, you know, maybe you could give me another form of liberty, another form of emancipation. Many people grew up with a Pesach that was very, very difficult and emotionally challenging. The anxiety in the home, the trepidation, the fear, the lack of joy, the lack of happiness, is this how we're supposed to celebrate Zman Cheruseinu? As adults now, we need to take responsibility for our lives. We need to take responsibility for how we live, and we need to take responsibility for the fact that we can change things up. Even if we can't heal everything and transform everything, but we're adults, and as adults we have agency, and we have more agency than we imagine, even if we're struggling and we have to acknowledge those struggles. What is Pesach and what is not Pesach? Let's first describe what's not Pesach and let's let's discuss what Pesach is. I think what Pesach is not is a time where we should try to fit into someone else's expectations of what Pesach is supposed to look like. Many people come to the Seder table 
or to the holiday with so many expectations of what things are supposed to look like and what I'm supposed to be feeling. What am I supposed to be feeling? And if I don't live up to these expectations, I have a miserable Pesach. The Seder didn't work out. It was boring. It was uneventful. Nobody was interested. I wasn't interested. There was so much pressure. This becomes the highlight. There's no humanity. There's so much anxiety. There's so many difficult memories. There's so much pain. There's a lot of anger that comes up and dysfunction that comes up. And people look at their Pesach and they say, this was a horrible experience. Now, I want you to know something. There's 15 steps to the Seder. The first one is Kaddish. Kaddish, we make Kiddish. Or Chatz, we wash our hands without a blessing. Karpas. What's the last one? What's the number 15? Right, do you remember? You have Shulchan Aruch, we have the meal. Then we have Beirach, we bench. Tzafen, we, I'm sorry, Shulchan Aruch, Tzafen, we eat which means hidden, we deal with the hidden stuff. Beirach, we bench. Halal, we say praise. And what's the last one? Nirza. What does Nirza mean? Does anybody know what Nirza is? Nirza is number 15. Nirza means it was pleasing. It was good. What step is that? What's the 15th step? What do we do by Nirza? My dearest friends, Nirza is the highlight. You know what Nirza means? Nirza means it was beloved. It was lerotzoin. It was accepted. It was embraced. It was cherished. At the end of the say there, I look in the mirror and I say, eh, another Pesach bites the dust. Another wasted evening, another stressful seder that I really don't like. Nirza is, God has a different perspective. He's like, Hashem says, wow, you showed up 3,000 years later to celebrate the gift of human courage, to celebrate the gift that we don't have to live under tyranny forever, to celebrate the gift that our souls have a revolutionary spirit inside of them, searching for truth, looking parai in the eyes and saying, I am not your slave. I am not your slave. I was not designed to be. I have a phone, you got something. Go ahead, go ahead. I was not born to be a slave of Pharaoh. I was born actually to be a channel for infinite love, light, hope, healing, wisdom, truth, authenticity, authenticity, redemptive consciousness. I was born to be a channel for my own deepest soul and resources and creativity. Nirza, God says, wow, three and a half, it's been almost three and a half thousand years, 3,300 years and change, you have showed up to make a statement that you deserve a better life. You're searching for a better life. You want real relationships. You want authentic relationships. You don't want to be afraid of your vulnerability. That's Pesach. Now, between you and I, can you celebrate that feeling that I just, exp- that I just described? Can you celebrate the fact that you're showing up that way? That is what Pesach is. Now we have all these expectations, what you're supposed to be, what you're not supposed to be, what you say you're supposed to look like, what it's not supposed to look like. I want to suggest to you, honor whatever is coming up. Honor all the challenges, all the problems, and just show up with your truthfulness. Show up with your heart. Show up with your love. Show up with your pain. We create images. The kids have to be like this. The father has to be like this. The mother has to be like this. And we drive ourselves crazy. I know a guy, right? He bought before Pesach 40 Haggadahs. <laughs> I'm laughing. 40 Haggadahs so he could prepare all these beautiful insights for the Seder. The problem is that right in the beginning, Yankee poured the wine on Dvairi and Chaya poured the wine on his matzah. And that was it. At that point, there was a third world war and all of his teachings that he wanted to share for hours, nobody was interested in them. And he felt it was such a disaster. I told him, you know, there was one biblical mitzvah on the night of Pesach besides eating matzah. Does anybody know what's the one mitzvah the Torah gives us for the night of Pesach? I'm not talking about all the customs and traditions and songs. That's beautiful. I'm talking about one mitzvah in Torah besides eating matzah. There's one mitzvah in the Torah. You know what that is? Two words. Connect to your child. Talk to your child. Share this story with your child. That's Pesach. Pesach is, can I sit down, look at my child, at my children, and say, wow, thank you for being my son. Thank you for being my daughter. And just, I want to be with you. 
I want to be present with you. Sometimes you don't have a child. You're there with yourself. Be present to the child inside of you. You know, the Gemara, the Mishnah says that if there's no children to ask questions, the wife, your wife asks, or your husband asks, and what if there's nobody else? What if you're alone at the say? You know what the Mishnah says? Ask questions yourself. Why? Be with your own child. Let your child ask questions. Imagine your inner child is free tonight. So I say to you, don't always look for answers. Come to the Seder with all your questions. Come with your pain. Come with your anxiety. Come with all of these voices and messages that are there and then say, you know what, God? I want to be free tonight. I just want to be. I want to be real. I want to be authentic. I don't have any expectations of what it's supposed to look like. Just connect. Connect to your real self and connect to the people around you in the most authentic way. And that's why Pesach, we don't only drink wine. We don't only eat matzah. We also eat mar. Why do we eat mar? Why are we eating bitter herbs? Because part of the experience of freedom is to make place and space for all the parts of yourself. We have pain. We have anxiety. We have disappointment. We have trauma. We have wounds. And as Pesach presents fresh start, fresh start doesn't mean that the moment I sit down for the Seder, all my marrow is gone. It's not gone. But if I could bring it all to the table, there's place for everything. That's why we make a sandwich. Kena Sehila, what's the sandwich? Pesach, matzah, marrow. The sandwich is, Pesach represents beef, you know? Lamb chops, delicious. Marrow is bitter, bitter herbs. Matzah is bland. Life is a combination of moments of great delight and delicacies and moments of bitterness and frustration and pain and moments that are bland. And we make a sandwich. We make space for all these parts showing up. I want to show up with my authenticity and my vulnerability with all the parts of myself, without the need to fit into anybody else's box of what my Pesach table is supposed to look like. And I think if we can tell myself, if we can tell ourselves, if I could tell myself, you could tell yourself, you know, this Pesach, I don't have to be a slave to all the Pharaoh voices inside of me. These are voices of Pharaoh. Be like this, be like this, be like this, with this inner critic that is constantly taking me away from where I am, constantly making sure I can't be present, constantly putting me into a place of incessant anxiety that I'm a disappointment to God, a disappointment to my family, a disappointment to the Jewish people. Those are Pharaoh's voices inside of us. You know what? It's one of the voices. Fine. Bring him also to the table. But he can't run the show. Let Moses run the show. <laughs> Let Moses run the show. Para is there. But Pare is not the boss anymore. Pare is not my master anymore. I can make choices. I could see what's happening inside of me. And then I can show up. That now, I want to be now specific about the two questions. This is the general comment. You speak about being an orphan. There's a lot of pain in the say there. There's a lot of pain. And you can show up and you could be very authentic. Be authentic with yourself. Be authentic with your pain. Be authentic with your spouse. And maybe connect to your siblings from that place. Yes. This is not the picture-perfect say there with both parents, Zadie and Bobby, sitting at the head of the table and saying, what nachas? There are voids, but you know what? We're showing up together as a family. We're showing up to cry together, to laugh together, to dance together, to be real together. There's no substitute for that in the world. We're showing up to try to become freer tonight, to try to become more real, more authentic. Here's the second question, very, very important. I'm sorry that your parents have a hard time seeing your humanity, but I hope you could see your humanity, and I hope you could see the humanity in your siblings, and I hope you can create real space for that. And instead of seeing Pesach as a burden of truth, having to show up in a certain image that is really alien to you, what if Pesach is really about stripping all the images? getting rid of all those facades. Isn't that what freedom means? Getting rid of all those cover-ups and saying, here I am, <laughs> the real me, the real soul. Wow. Okay, a lot to, uh, a lot to chew on here. I know we have a few other uh, questions. Again, they're obviously going to be of similar topics, but let me go to a live one. Leah, if you want to unmute. I know you had a live question for Rabbi YY. Go ahead. Hold on here. Where is... Leah, are you there? Uh, I think this is... 
Hold on here. One second on unmuting. Let's see here. Ask to unmute. Can't unmute. Um, okay. Well, we'll give her a, a moment to figure out the unmuting thing. Um, another question came in, slightly different. Okay, I got unmuted. Oh, I don't know what happened. You got it unmuted. Yeah. Gvaldic. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I was stuck. Um, should I? I can't decide if I should start the video or not. Like, if a lot of people are going to be able to replay it to see my face. It's hopefully going to be. It's hopefully going to be watched by half of Paul Yisrael at least. No, so, so then whatever, I'm not, whatever yeah. you're comfortable with. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I don't. So, first of all, to what you just said, that like meant so much to me because for more than one reason, I need to go away with my family for Pesach. I'm not being home. I'm going to a program. And my community, I'm from Borough Park, Hasidish, and everyone is talking and saying crazy. And my mother in law is saying, I'm never going to be able to do Shadduchim with my kids because I'm going away. And she's fuming mad and she's making fun of it and saying like the kind of crowd, like we're going to eat chametz on Pesach and like literally, and for me to swallow all of that and like, you know, there's so many reasons behind the scenes that like if I would stay home, my kids would not have a happy answer. And by me going away, I'm going to give my kids connection and, and happiness and, and an enjoyable time for all of us. But yet to have everyone talking about me and shunning me and like oh you can't manage to make Pesach or whatever it is and some people even made a rumor that I'm sick I don't even want to say what they said which sickness I have because must be if I'm going away I must be sick because why are you going away or like tapping out or and I'm still right. struggling with it because it's like you know my mother it's everybody they're just like they want to kill us for going away I'm just wondering, why do they want to kill you? Like, wh why can't they respect that this is what you guys feel you need? Like, what? Why is there so much anger? Like, because it's a or shame Hashem, they have them. a seder and they have a family, right? I'm sure. Like, what? It's like it's they're embarrassed. They're I'm embarrassed. Very embarrassed of her kid that this is what her kid got to. Like, he's what like, if her, what if you would tell? I'm just I'm just wondering. Forgive my ignorance. What if you would say, "Mommy, I love you." But this is what I need to do for my family. This is because of our situation. This is what we need. Like, I so love she's you. Like, but you don't care that I, I, I don't really want you to go there. Like, you don't care. But like, should my children me. come, mommy? If my children need something and this is better for our family, wouldn't you want your daughter to do that and your grandchildren to have a much more meaningful Pesach? Like, I'm no, thinking, she wants her if my that children make it would at home. She wants that we should be able to make it at home. That's what she wants. But I mean, could you respect that you're an adult, your husband is an adult, and this is a choice that you felt is the right My thing? My question is also, is it so bad to go away? I don't see it as I don't see it as bad as I think it's a very personal choice, but I don't know why we have to be dismissive and so judgmental. I think the first sign of freedom for everybody is Man is that we can ex experience Pesach in a beautiful way and not judge other people. When I'm sitting and judging other people. I don't think that's a sign of freedom. I think that's a sign of enslavement. You know, when we have, when I'm confident, when I know my connection to my soul and to Hashem, I'm happy for other people and I celebrate the choices of other people. So I don't think, I don't know the details. So I don't want to give a commentary on the situation, Leia, when I don't know all the details and what's going on and why you're leaving and what's the advantage of leaving and what are the pros and the cons. So forgive me that I'm not getting specific because I, you know, I don't know the circumstances and the reasons you want to leave, but I don't see it as good or evil or as good as bad. I think these are choices. A lot of wonderful people go away for Pesach and they have an amazing Pesach and a lot of wonderful, wonderful people stay home for Pesach and they have an amazing Pesach and a lot of people stay home and they're miserable and a lot of people go away and they're miserable. I think these are choices that we make and we want to make sure that those choices are coming from a place of empowerment, not from a place of weakness. It's coming from a place of love, not from a place of negativity. It's coming from a place of inner strength. How do I know if it's coming from, from weakness or from power? That's a good question. That's a very that's a very good question about many decisions in life. And I think, you know, in, in I think it's important for you and, and your husband to really pause and breathe and really try to go deeper into yourself and ask yourself the question, you know, are we make is it, is this choice gonna be truly beneficial emotionally, physically, spiritually, psychologically for us and our children? 
Is this really coming from a place of, you know, deep awareness? Is it coming from a place of, of connection to our deepest self? Is this a decision that 50, 60 years from now, when I look back and I may have evolved in many ways, I'm going to be proud of, you know, I sometimes tell people, sometimes it's good to ask yourself, you know what, I'm going to be 95 years old and I'm going to look back at this moment. Will I be proud of this decision or will I not be proud of this decision? If it's a decision you're going to be proud of, so yeah, be proud of it and embrace it. And if it's really coming from my weakness, then maybe I want to challenge it. But it's very difficult, and it's, I don't think it's, it's, um, it's needed to be able to go into a place of judgment um, to ourselves or to others. That's why it's surprising for me. I think we need to have conversations with ourselves and with others from a place of peace, from a place of serenity, from a place of tranquility. The fact that in the tradition of many people, they don't go away for Pesach, that's a beautiful thing, an amazing thing. But I think it must come from a place of inner emotional health, not from intense pressure. So respect yourself. And then challenge yourself from a place of compassion and authenticity to be able to make sure that this decision is coming from your higher angels. In other words, it's really the best thing. You're right. The focus of Pesach is to be able to connect with ourselves and with our children in the deepest way. That's the story of Pesach. And if staying in a certain place is going to have the opposite effect, then maybe it's the right decision. But I think make that decision from a place of try to the best of your ability to make it to a place of clarity. Maybe it's important to have somebody who's objective, but somebody who knows you and somebody whom you trust and somebody who is sensitive to your needs and to your unique reality, because every one of us has a unique reality. Maybe some, you know, maybe a good friend or maybe a confidant or a therapist or, or somebody that, you know, your husband and you really trust. Sometimes it's good to have, you know, somebody from the outside who doesn't yeah carry... that, i had that a few people they said i need to go like i should go okay. it's not okay. called coming from running away from family or any of that it's about their own you okay. know mental health things you know okay okay so 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 if if you come to the conclusion that for mental health this is the right thing to do then don't don't be judgmental of yourself be compassionate towards yourself you're trying to do the right thing you're trying to be a loving mother and your fa- your husband is supposed to try to be a loving father and and you know i'm thinking just in my case like if a child would come to me and say for my mental health this is what i feel i need i want i want to celebrate that i want to be there for my children in the best way possible so again i don't know the details but i think we well many we, people would like to have a parent like you that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> that's a compliment tell my mother in law tell my <laughs> My mother-in-law, do me a favor. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I would love to have each child by my seder, but but more importantly is I want my child to have the best Pesach ever, right? <laughs> okay, now for the harder question. I'm gonna tell the you, I'm gonna question. tell you something personal. I have a daughter. How old is she? She's a teenager, and she decided she wants to go to a Pesach program. We're Chabad of Rwanda. <laughs> and that's where she is. That's where she is. Chabad of Rwanda. <laughs> Wow. You know where Rwanda is? Anybody knows where that is? 18 hour flight. So <laughs> it's wow. the first year without my daughter at the Seder, but this is what she wanted. And she has friends going there and she has some people, very special people that she's close to from her school. And uh, I celebrate that, right? I'm going to miss my daughter, but I celebrate it. I think every one of us in our own way, we want to always be there for our children to help them do what is best for them. That, that's the role of parents. Um, again, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound judgmental to anybody because it's really unfair. Because I don't know all the circumstances. I'm just giving a general, a blueprint and outline. So discuss it with the right people. Maybe you did make a decision from a place of strength and love and connection, and then celebrate it and do not wallow in guilt. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then now for the little bit of a harder question, more maybe vulnerable question. Um, what if you struggle with like an addiction? Okay. And that addiction is not allowed on Shabbos and Yantiv. And like Shabbos, Yantiv, especially Pesach, it's supposed to be a sense of freedom, but then you feel very opposite of free. You feel like you're in chains and you're like counting down the minutes because you don't have access to, you know, whatever you need to have access to. And sometimes I'm like, but like, this is what Hashem wants, like that every moment should be such agony and you just like want to, get over with this day and you can enjoy the whole yantav or shabbos or whatever it is and you don't have that freedom feeling because you don't have something that you really need mm. and by why we have a very similar question okay somebody who said rabbi why why five days out of eight are shabbos and yantav 
I feel extremely lonely all the time. And the only thing that keeps me away from feeling so lonely and depressed is obviously my phone. A few strong words, but uh, how am I supposed to survive five out of eight days without using a phone or can I? Right. Okay. So uh, here again, you know, it behooves me to say that th these are two very sensitive questions and they need to be addressed with a lot of, you know, TLC, tender love and care. So first I want to just make a general suggestion and then I want to get a little more specific. The general suggestion is everyone who's struggling with a serious addiction and, uh, or let's put it, uh, you know, a serious attachment to something that they feel is very, very important for them. And without that, there are many symptoms that and things that can go wrong. I think it's important to have a figure, a rabbinic figure that you trust and who understands trauma, who understands addiction, who's sensitive to it. There are such people and they can guide you about Shabbos and Yom Tif. What is the best way to be able to navigate these days in order to be able to emerge from them as a happy person, as a healthy person, and that should contribute to your well-being. The point of Shabbos and Yom Tif is to contribute to our well-being. God wanted to give us a day of rest, a day of serenity, a day of joy, a day of celebration, a day of pausing, a day of, of going into ourselves and, and, and loving, loving life, loving ourselves. So the whole point of Shabbos and Yom Tif is to make our lives happier, not more miserable. So I think it's important to have someone who's, who's, very sensitive and aware of trauma and addiction and there are such people um Rabbi Eichelen, i think also has such names and i would just get in contact with them whether it's about pesach or other days of holiness Shabbos and Yom Tov, i would or... like to know because i don't know someone that i would trust and that knows trauma and that like you know all the things you listed it's hard to find okay, Rabbi Eichelen, do you have a name or a few names of, of we, figures? I, I, I might have a name or two and we can certainly uh, okay. look around and find so, within so, so you'll a pass it on because yeah. some of them are very sensitive and wise and they have experience yeah. with this and sometimes there's different things you know that can be you know can be can be considered and and thought about and speculated but I just want to make also another general comment about all of this again without knowing the specific details and I'm not a Paisic I'm not a halachic authority who gives halachic verdict it's not my field or expertise so therefore I'm you know, I'm just sensitive to that, so I just want to make a general comment. And that is, sometimes, not always, not always, but sometimes these challenges can really challenge us and stimulate us to be able to go much deeper into ourselves. Sometimes God gives us opportunities in life that we're, so to speak, pushed to the wall, and we have to make a decision which way we're going to go. Now, sometimes we're not ready for it. And then we need good guidance of what we should be doing, what we should not be doing, what we need to do for certain, you know, especially things that may be pikuach nefesh. Sometimes things can be dangerous and you have to take care of your health and your mental health and figure out what is halachically allowed. And you'll be surprised. There's a lot of things that can be done. But sometimes, and sometimes, and maybe this is not an appropriate answer to you, and that's why I'm being very, very sensitive. But at least for some of us, it's an appropriate answer. And that is sometimes, you know, let me give an example, right? I sometimes go on a diet because I can use a diet. Yeah. And sometimes food is an issue that I struggle with. When I'm stressed, I eat. And sometimes when I have withdrawal symptoms, it's very, very hard because my body gets very, very anxious. And it's important for me to stay the course and say, you know, this is an opportunity for me to go into a place of healing. It's an opportunity for me to challenge those voices that want me to disintegrate. If you're ready for it, a time like Pesach may be a tremendous gift and a tremendous opportunity to say, you know what? What if I could learn to spend time with myself? I remember hearing once from Dr. Tversky, you know, the legendary Jewish psychotherapist, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky, you've heard of him. And he once shared, I think he shared this numerous times, how once he went to the doctor and the doctor told him that he needs to uh, go to the spa. And he needs to go into jacuzzi and take a hot bath and has to be there for a half an hour just to relax because he was stressed and overwhelmed. So he wanted to go with a book or with a newspaper. This is before the phones. But he said, no, you got to go without anything. And he said he went into this hot bath. He went to this special spa. And it was amazing for the first three minutes. And then afterwards, he's like, what am I supposed to do? 
And he said, I was so bored. I was so bored. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a book. I didn't have a newspaper. I didn't have anything to read. I'm just sitting. And then he says, I realized that I hated my own company. I hated my own company. I always needed someone else, something else to stimulate me. And then he said these words or similar to these words. He said, I realized that I don't like myself. I am the most boring person in my own eyes. If you would put somebody else there, it would be fine. If you would give me a newspaper, I'd be fine. If they'd give me a phone, I'd be fine. But if you give me me, it's worthless. So I say to you, maybe we have an opportunity on Shabbos and Yom Tif and Pesach to be able to say, maybe you could become your own best friend. Maybe whatever that telephone is going to give you or that addiction is going to give you, you can give yourself. You're actually, I would vouch to say that you're, pretty, you're a pretty interesting person. <laughs> You're a pretty interesting person. Maybe there's a voice inside of me that says, I have nothing to do with myself. You know what? Maybe for a half an hour, breathe. Learn techniques of being with yourself. Meditation, breath work, internal, focusing internally, relaxing your mind, studying, learning, reading, tuning into your inner music, conversations with real people that allow you to connect. Maybe these are tremendous opportunities that challenge us, but maybe will allow you to go to the next level of healing and rehabilitation where you could start enjoying yourself. Because I tell you, if you can do this and get over this, this uh, hurdle, this obstacle, it may open up new vistas for your life, not only on Shabbos and Yom Tif, Every day of your life. I think generally in our society, we only time with ourselves. There's many people, especially the youth, who don't even know what it means to spend time with themselves. And I think it's very noticeable. People don't know about their emotions. They don't know about their feelings. They can't talk about themselves. It's very hard for them to have real relationships. We're always, we're always numbing ourselves. Here's a clip and here's another clip and here's Netflix and here's a film and here's food and here's a drink and here's this website and here's this addiction and here's this issue and here's this drug. Now, sometimes you're not ready for it, I understand. But I encourage people, maybe it's time to challenge ourselves to actually start spending time with ourselves and our loved ones in an authentic and human-to-human, human-to-human encounters. Wow, that was so nice. So it's it's not a phone. I definitely, I actually think I do, I do know how to spend time with myself. I, I go on a walk every day, 30 minutes, talking just nice. with myself. I, I do, I learn to, you know, but I, I do see how you're saying it could be on a deeper level. And now you just clinched my thing that I'm going away. Now comes full circle because it's definitely a lot, a lot easier for me when I'm in company and with people and connecting with others. And so I think yeah. that actually is going to be a great opportunity for this young to. to it's very, very this. special to connect yeah. to people. You know, we have lost that art of really connecting to people in deep, meaningful, vulnerable, authentic conversations, beginning with family, people that we trust people that we cannot just sit and babble about nothing and, you know, gossip and slander and stupidity and pettiness, but really connect. There's nothing as powerful as connection, real connection. Leia, wow. Okay. Leia, Thanks you'll, so you'll, much. You gave me a lot know, of food for thought. Okay, Leia, you're Leia, a source you'll of inspiration. Us. Leia, you'll update us after this trip to Venture Shop. You let us know how it goes. Yes, I will. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Um, I do want to move on. Akiva, are you there? We got another live question, Rabbi Waiwai. Akiva, if you want to unmute yourself. Hold on there, Akiva. I'll ask you to unmute. There you go. Go ahead, Akiva. Hi, Rabbi Waiwai. How are you? Um alaykum, Rabbi Akiva. I remember growing up, it was a big deal. My father, when we were kids, used to wear a kittel. And then um, in the middle of our, uh, at some point in my childhood, my father came to the to the Seder without a kittel. And we were all like, you know, what's going on? And he gave us this whole sermon how the side of Pesach is that it's all about Messiah. And that the, the reason why it's called the Seder is because this is exactly how you're supposed to do it. The whole idea is... This is how your father did it. This is how you did it. And so for years, I just thought my father was probably out to lunch. And that's why he didn't wear a kittel because he wasn't, you know, in the know. And he, maybe he was uh, less uh, um, learned. And, you know, we went to yeshiva, so we should wear a kittel. And he said, no, my father didn't wear a kittel. 
And that's what I'm going to do. And the whole idea of Seder is you do it exactly like your father did it. And this is exactly how to do it. So the idea that you were saying of, you know, letting go of expectations of how it should go is something that I am hoping to do this year. But to be honest, I'm feeling anxious about it because yeah. I assure you that if I do things the way that I want to do, it'll be very different than my father. Um, and lastly, and along these lines, um, there's are somewhat connected. It doesn't, the idea of making this all about Gishmak for the kids, you know, starting from Magid, it's like you finish Manishtan and Halach Ma'anya, and then it's like, you know, Amr Balazar, Yachomir, Rosh and like, it just, let's just say not very kid oriented. And so it's sort of like, like my father said, you know, like, this is what we do and that's how we do it. And, you know, stop asking questions. This is how, this is how it's supposed to be done. And this is how we did it for thousands of years. Don't think you're such an, as my grandmother would say, don't think you're such an Uber Beautiful question. Beautiful question. You said don't ask questions, but I think at the say that we do ask questions. So just for the record, we have to You're not allowed that. to ask certain questions. Oh, oh, don't ask certain questions. Only ask the questions that I tell you you can ask. The don't ask your one. real questions. I think one. this is where the point really comes in. Everybody here knows that there's many families, let's call it Hamish families, Chassidusha families, Yeshivisha families, whatever it is, where there's tremendous amounts of Chumras on Pesach. A tremendous amount of stringencies. People don't eat out. There's people, I yeah, mean, I grew up, my mother, God bless her, you know, everybody, we squeezed our own oranges. The sugar was cooked. You didn't use oil, right? You used schmaltz, chicken fat. Uh, we checked every particle of sugar, every particle of salt. Um, uh, my father didn't even eat tomatoes because you can't peel them, <laughs> right? The only, uh, those, I'm just saying, uh, with people, and I know many families and many communities, a lot, a lot of stringencies. And, you know, some people are very dismissive of them and say, eh, it's all garbage and it's just trauma and trauma and trauma and trauma and trauma. Leave me alone. This is not my Pesach. And they go to the other extreme. You know, they're doing pizza and bagels, kashala Pesach, and uh, <laughs> sushi with quinoa, you know, <laughs> donuts, of course, everything, kashala Pesach, and, you know, chocolate and macaroons, and <laughs> they're eating everything. I, I, want, I want to explain something, and I think it'll be very helpful for us. Pesach is an amazing, amazing holiday, and all the traditions of our parents are incredibly meaningful if we can embrace them from a place of inner love and connection. But if a tradition of my father or my mother is causing me anxiety, and it's killing the Pesach. It's killing my mood. For whatever reason. For whatever reason. Maybe I grew up in a home that was unsafe. Maybe I could still feel the toxicity in my home before Pesach. Maybe I felt the pressure. I could still feel the pressure of my father and mother. And they weren't happy. Maybe it's all the mitzvahs and the rituals. And I always felt guilty. And I always felt that I can't live up to it. And it's just this heaviness. Whatever the reason is. But somehow there are voices in me that take me away from a Pesach that is relaxing, then I feel that focusing on every stringency and focusing on every ritual really takes us away from the Yom of Pesach. So you have to, I think we really have to know where we are and be very honest with it. If I can embrace all these traditions and all these rituals and do it exactly as my father did it, but I see it as an opportunity, I see it as a gift, and my children feel the joy the joy in B'dikas Chametz, and the joy in baking matzah, and the joy in Mayim Shalono, and the joy in setting up the Kaira, and the joy in cleaning the house, and the joy in going to the Seder, and the joy in eating very selective foods on Pesach, because I feel that Pesach is a gift and an opportunity to connect to my soul in a deeper way, and therefore I am voluntarily embracing all these rituals. Gewaldik, matoiva manoyim, beautiful. But if for whatever reason, and this is not about a judgment one way or another, if for whatever reason, that's just going to create so much pressure and anger and frustration, then I say, at least hold on to the core of the Yom Tif. And the core of the Yom Tif is what I said before. It's letting go of all the paras, letting go of the need to be anxious, letting go of the voice in me that tells me that I'm a loser and I always do everything wrong because I can't live up to my father. Please do me a favor. That is the voice of Pare, and I don't think we should be slaves to Pare. And that's why I said the last statement in the Haggadah is Nirza. Nirza is the only step in the Haggadah where we do nothing. 
all the 14 steps, Kaddish, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, we do, we do. We break the matzah, we say this, we pull, whatever it is. Near to you don't do anything. You know why? You don't got to do anything. Sit back, relax, and celebrate the courage of showing up and saying, I want to be a good person. I want to be a connected person. I want to be a free person. I want to be an authentic person by becoming aware of those voices having compassion for the voices, having empathy for the voices, and then choosing to focus my attention to the place of connection. In terms of the tradition of the Haggadah, it's long, all these pieces, it's a very good question. And just to make a general comment, every paragraph in the Haggadah has priceless depth to it, layers of significance, but it's just like davening. Can everybody really focus on the whole davening from brachas, from the blessings, all the way through Haidi, Baruch Shama, Pesukah De Zimra, Az Yashir, uh, blessings before Shema, Shema, Shmaina Esra, Tachnon, Asher, Volatzian, Shir Shalyoim, Kaveh, Aleinu, right? And completely be present. We all know what that looks like. Some people, yeah. Some people maybe have to choose one paragraph of davening, and that's where you focus. That's where you meditate. The other things, maybe I need to say faster. So I think every family has to figure this out. Yes, we want to focus on our children. Yes, there's a whole text of the Haggadah, and we're not going to skip the Haggadah, just to go straight to Dayenu, although there's always somebody who's holding by Dayenu. And, and my, my say that when I'm starting to make Kiddush, there's somebody who's already almost holding by Dayenu. By the time I'm by the Manishtana, you know, he's ready for the Afikaiman. Uh, <laughs> there's always that character, and you know what, God bless them. The point is, sometimes, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes we have to do a fast seder. It doesn't say anywhere that the seder has to be two and a half, three and a half, four and a half hours until everybody gets upset. So you have to know the people. You have to know the people, you know. Sometimes <laughs> we have to do a fast seder because the objective is not for it to look a certain way. The objective is, I want to share my love, the story, the story of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the story of Jewish love, Jewish faith, Jewish unity, Jewish resilience, the story of our inner soul. I want to I want to share it with my children. And, and let's not divert our attention from the objective. And between you and me, think about what Pesach looked like 3,000 years ago when the Jews left Egypt. Maybe our Pesach that doesn't look exactly like our father will be more similar to the original Pesach. I'm not so sure, you know, that, that that original Pesach looked exactly what our Pesach looks like today. Well, I really like the idea of, I don't have to puzzle that whole concept of Seder and Messiah and all that. No, no. The idea is if, if I can take it in a way exactly. where it's going to be Lebedic for me, then have at it. Exactly. But if it's not going to do that, then... Don't try to exactly. do that in exchange for... Exactly. Don't lose the soul. So we, I could just say that I, I had a, a, a meticulous Pesach and followed everything, but I was miserable. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's interesting. Minhag. Minhag means a custom, right? It says, Toisvis writes, Toisvis writes in Masechus, uh, Menachus, Minhag is all Torahu. The Minhag of Jews is Torah. It says in Rishonim, Minhig is the same letters like Gehenim. Minhig is the letters Gehenim, which means purgatory. So which one is it? Is a Minhig Torah or is a Minhig purgatory Gehenim? So somebody once told me, my Minhig is Torah, your Minhig is Gehenim. But I'll give you the real answer. The real answer is this. If a Minhig is coming from a place of love and passion, it's Torah. If a Minhig is coming from anxiety and crazy pressure, and making me feel horrible about myself, it's a Gehenna. And you don't have to go into Gehenna on Pesach. You have to go into Gan Eden on Pesach. So yeah, it comes, it comes to food. You know, if I say, you know, yeah, it's a gift for me. It's a privilege for me to eat only these foods on Pesach. This allows me to tune into the spirituality of the holiday. That's amazing. And there's so much truth to that. Because when we live a very disciplined life and we sometimes create very powerful boundaries. It allows us to tune into a much deeper energy, but only from a place of deep attachment and celebration. And you know what? The kids see it right away. They see it right away. They see, they see it on your face. They see it on the radiance. We cannot fake it to our kids. They know when we're relaxed and they know when we're miserable. They know it. And they're always going to remember, was Pesach the time that Tati bonded? He was real? We could actually feel his heart or Pesach was a time when Tati was more detached. 
because he felt so horrible with himself and he was feeling so guilty about the fact that he's a miserable father and he's destroying the whole Masada of his father. We actually couldn't connect him because he was a shell of a person. You want your children to say, wow, Pesach, we connected to Tati's heart or Pesach, we connected to Tati's shell. I know which choice we should all make. I guess just two follow up uh, practical questions. Um, practically speaking, that means just quickly diving up those parts that you don't connect to. And second of all, the kids, I remember when I was a kid, it was always, you're not allowed to eat more than a kazais of the potato, but we're all sitting there starving. And so everybody, <laughs> on a practical level, you know, the kid's hungry. And I'm not even talking about just kids under bar mitzvah. I'm talking about my 14-year-old is starting to get all edgy because, you know, he's starving. So, you know, I, I don't know what's halacha and what's minig. Like, can you just have something to eat? Can we quickly dive in through that part of the agoda? <laughs> Okay, so these are very, very specific questions. One good idea is to eat before Yom Tif a little bit. <laughs> That's one idea. Um, I think if it's going to ruin my kids' seder, uh, if it's going to completely ruin my kids' seder, they don't have the, the maturity to be able to, to celebrate doing it exactly the way, we could, we could make sure that they have an enjoyable seder, whatever that means. <laughs> and in terms of I think, I think to become obsessive, you know, uh, to become at the expense of little children can be an error. And then in terms of like quickly davening through those Yachom Ereshkaitis, just zip through it? If, 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 if we need to do it fast, we can do it fast. Yeah, we can do it fast. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Akiva. I just want to point out to everybody that, and I'll, I'll share it again on our community chat and I'll email it, but a week or two ago, Kesher Nafshi hosted a, Pre Pesach Halacha and Ashkafa discussion um, with Rabbi Shimon Russell and Rabbi Gershon Sheffield. Um, again, it's for it falls under the crisis chinuch, but I suspect that there's probably a lot there that uh, that's relevant for um, just making a regular say they're enjoyable. So I will send that out again. The Rabbi Yy, before we go, yeah. um, I, I, I have two questions that came in. One I think you answered, but Maybe I can ask in a different way, which is essentially if we want to hopefully give our children a positive feeling about Pesach, you know, what's, what's, is there a particular theme that somebody asks? They're like one message, like obviously it's hard to give over a bunch of things all the time. You have a choice and you have, you know, give over one thing to your children to give them an uplifting pace off, what is that? Um, and then the other question that came in, which oftentimes shows up, you mentioned about Minhagim, Humras, somebody asked the question just relating to, you know, managing Shalom bias as it relates to um, this sensitive topic of, you know, Pesach traditions and customs. And then we'll wind this even again. Excellent down. question, excellent question. So I want to share a little story that I think could be very, very helpful. Um, among Hasidim, there's a very well-known stringency. It's called Gebrachts. Many of you know it, which means we're very careful that the matzah should not get wet. And some are very stringent about it. And the reason is, it's actually a chumr, it's a stringency that comes from the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya. And I think all or most Hasidim follow it very, very, uh, you know, very seriously and it's basically that in his times they started to develop these commercial matzah bakeries and very often if you go into a matzah bakery you see you come out with your jacket and there's particles of flour and he felt that the matzahs are baked so fast there may be particles of flour and if the matzah gets wet even one particle of flour can become chametz because it's not baked and chametz also bemashu and that's why they're very careful not to have the matzah wet. So I want to tell you a little story that happened this happened on the second floor of 770 Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn with the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, known as the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe Dayat, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, was sitting at his table on Pesach. And there were many guests around the table. There was like a tish of Habrengen. And there was a Jew there who was from non-Hasidic background. And he saw what's called barsht, you know, beet juice. And what's better than dipping the matzah in barsht? So he takes his matzah and he dips it in the barsht. And... There were some yeshiva boys around him got very alarmed because in the presence of the Rebbe Dayat of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he's making his matzah wet. This was like a no-no, still a no-no in the Hasidic world and especially in the Chabad Lubavitch world. 
So there's like this whole commotion and they're telling him you're not allowed to do it. And the Rebbe Rayat, the sixth Lubavitch was at the head table. And he asks uh, one of the people sitting near him, I think it was Rabbi Shmuel Levit, one of the Hasidim, he says, what's going on in there? What's the commotion? So he says that this fellow dipped his matzah into the borscht, into the beet juice, into the beet soup. And the boys are giving him a piece of their mind and telling him that you're not allowed to do this and you shouldn't do this. And, and the Rebbe said in Yiddish these words, and I want to repeat them in Yiddish and then I'll translate. He said, Besser aroite matzah vi aroiten ponim. Much better a red matzah than a red face. Meaning, if this is going to come at the expense of humiliating this person and causing him to blush, our wonderful stringency not to eat gebrachts is off. We're barking up the wrong tree. And here is the point you asked the question about shalom bias. The key of all Torah and mitzvahs, as the Rambam says, the Rambam writes in the laws of Hanukkah, the whole Torah was given to create peace and harmony in the world. And that begins in our home and our lives. So we always want to be present to our spouse, present to our wife, present to our husband, present to their needs. And my priorities may be different. I may want to have a certain type of Pesach and I may, be want to, I may want to be very careful about these things. And that's beautiful and it's wonderful. But if I find that my celebration of Pesach is coming at the expense of peace in the house, harmony in the house. I'm screaming at my kids. I'm screaming at my wife. I'm angry. That's not Zman Chay No, I didn't leave Mitzrayim. Maybe I went into a deeper Mitzrayim. Maybe I'm using religion and using Pesach and using my obsessions and using my, rit- using my rituals actually to become confrontational, to become egotistical. Maybe it's my own pain and trauma and anxiety and OCD and PTSD that's really feeding my Pesach. So to really go out of Mitzrayim, we have to ask ourselves, am I showing up as a much more loving person, as a much more present dad, as a much more present husband and wife? Because if not, maybe I really, really have to go deeper and examine where all of my stringencies are coming from. If Pesach is creating such a pressure cooker in the house that husbands and wives are killing each other, and it's taken away from the shalom bias, we have to ask ourselves tough questions. We, yeah, we all know Pesach is hard work. There's cleaning the house, and there's checking for the chametz, and there's buying all the food, and there's preparing the house, and there's the seder, and there's the kids. I know that. And that's why we have to be so much more loving and so much more present and so much more tolerant and so much less judgmental and so much more compassionate. And remember, God did not give us Pesach to destroy our marriages, to destroy our families, the opposite. And if it's doing it, we have to sit back and revisit how we are going to do this in a better way. Maybe we have to... (laughs) rethink a lot of things and i think you know this is important and and you ask like what should be the main message we give over to our children it's it's such a such a good question and i think certainly one of the the deepest messages is like the navi the navi the navi yermio says about leaving mitzrayim kai amar hashem zacharti lach chesed nurayach avas klu leisayach we say to Shoshana, God says, I remember uh, the, the kindness of your youth, the love, the love when we just met each other. You followed me into a desert, into a land that was not planted, that was unsown. In other words, God is saying, I remember those youthful days when you just followed me into nomad land because of that relationship. And I think that message is so powerful. When I can show up for my loved ones and make them feel that our relationship is more important than everything else, that our love towards each other, parents and children, spouses, siblings, family, loved ones, our relationship is more important than everything. And if I have to follow you into a midbar, be'eretz lo'izruah, knowing that that's where part of my soul is, that's where God is, that's where truth is. I do it with glee, I do it with joy. I think that energy being communicated to our children is the source of resilience. I think there's also the element of the ability to be able to be humble. You know, matzah is all about humility. It's all about vulnerability. It's all about 
having, it's called lechem oini, the bread of poverty, you know, teaching our children that we can have real conversations, we can address all of our problems, we can be honest with ourselves, we don't have to be inflated chametz, we can be humble matzah, and even the matzah itself we break, you know, yachatz. I think, you know, the, the afikoyman, right, we put away the afikoyman, I once said in a shir, I once read this, is a brilliant line, you know, we hide the afikoyman and then our children find them, find it, and then they give it back to us and they want a prize. What's the meaning of this? The meaning is that whatever we hide in life, our children are going to reveal. Whatever we put away, we hide it under the couch, our children are going to expose it. And when our children expose our dark secrets, we can either get angry at them or we could say thank you and we can embrace the afikaiman. When your child says, here, Tati and Mommy, whatever you hide, here it is, here's your afikaiman. You chutzpah, chutzpah, chutzpah. I've been hiding that for hundreds of years. And the children show us our afikaiman. It's called Safun. They expose the hidden stuff. We can get upset, we can get furious, or we could be grateful and actually give them a prize. Because if we take the afikaiman from them with grace and with dignity, Together we could say, Lashana Haba Shalayim. Only then can we both march towards redemption. I think these are some of the messages among many that we can tune into, we can, we can show up with for ourselves and for our loved ones. Rabbi Waiwai, when, uh, when you originally agreed to do this and you gave us an hour time limit, I was like, how are we going to get anything done in an hour? <laughs> but, uh, but Baruch Hashem, you, you, you came through and this uh, this last thing you mentioned, I saw it. You put it out on the video a few days ago, or somebody sent it to me uh, a few days ago on a video. So very, very powerful. You mean about the Afikaiman? About the Afikaiman thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, uh, you know we see it in our generation, right? We see it in our generation. Our first children. Time I heard it. It's beautiful. Ah. Huh? It's the first time I hear it, and it's just amazing. It's it's, it's, it's literally like it's heard it, in it, mind and. So it's, many a story, it's a story of our generation. It's literally the story of our generation. You know, people are getting upset at the kids and the youth and the, the you know, Messiah and Chutzpah. And I'm saying, they're just revealing the Afikaiman. They're helping us get to the end of exile. They're helping us eat the Afikaiman, finish the Seder. We can't finish the Seder without the Afikaiman. Thank them. Thank wow. them. They're bringing out the best in you. They're telling you, Tati, Mommy, we don't want you to live with demons anymore. You don't need to be fake. You don't need to hold on to all the traumas. We can all be free. We want freedom. We want holistic Judaism. We want authentic Yiddishkeit. You can have a relationship with Hashem that makes you dance. We can dance together. But this is a shift of, of consciousness, and it's a lot of inner work, and I understand the pain of not letting go of, of, of our wounds, you know, going back to that old model of, you know, this is chutzpah, and don't tell me what to do, and this is how we do it, and we, 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 we deprive ourselves from the gift of awareness. We shouldn't do that. And by the way, I should just say, I guess every Seder table has the children exposing weaknesses that we have. You know, the Seder is an intense time, and it's an opportunity for healing. So when things happen at the Seder and you're being triggered, it's a great moment. It's a great moment for inner healing. It's a great moment for curiosity. It's a great moment to turn to your spouse and say, wow, something just very intense came up for me. Or if you don't have a spouse, turn to somebody you trust or maybe just turn to yourself, you know? Be your own friend or turn to God. He's your friend. And say, wow, that this came up for me, wow. How can I use this as a springboard for, for inner awareness? And then we can actually say, Lashana Haba Birushalayim. We can actually <laughs> embark on a journey towards freedom. It's what everyone is looking for. People are sick and tired of being stuck in falsehood. We are vulnerable. We are broken people. We are humble people. That's what the matzah is about. Let's embrace it and celebrate it rather than hide it and cover it up and be anxious about anything and anybody that's trying to poke on our blockages <laughs> and try to make a puncture in our coping mechanisms, which are called Mitzrayim's paras that we are holding so sacred. Wow. Wow. Okay. Comments are, Rabbi Wawa will leave the Seder. My dream come true. 
I, 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 it's a fu- I appreciate your comment that it would be a dream come true to be at my Seder, but I just have to make a little confession. My Seder is like a lot of other people's Seders. <laughs> we have a lot of amazing personalities there. <laughs> And we're human beings, and we have flaws, <laughs> and we're vulnerable. <laughs> and I just try, I ask God to try to help me show up in my most real way and to be the best version of myself and to be able to be humble. All of us, I think, have been humbled by our stories, by the stories of our people, especially in the last six months. You know, just to show up with humility and authenticity and love and connection is already an achievement. And, uh, you know, I don't think you should look at the dream come true for somebody else's say there. It's your say there. It's your journey. It's, 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 it's your moment. I'm going to share this. I've shared this in the past for Pesach, and I, I, I want to share this especially with this audience. Uh, during Corona, you remember when Corona happened right before Pesach? What is it, March 2020? Many people found themselves doing the Seder themselves for the first time in their life, right? I know my mother, for the first time in her life, would not be with my father's gone. He passed, and my mother would be alone. And there were, it, was, it was very hard for people, especially elderly people who were the first time in history alone, sometimes a woman alone, a man alone. And, uh, you know, people couldn't be together. Everybody was scared, etc. And I shared then something very powerful. I, it, was, it was very meaningful for people. And that is that I remember I grew up in Crown Heights at the feet of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And the Rebbe didn't have children. And he had for many years, he did the Seder, just him and his wife alone for many, many years. And then his wife passed away in 1988 in Shvat. And people wondered who is the Rebbe going to do the Seder with that Pesach. And Ari Halberstam, you remember Ari Halberstam, he was killed on the Brooklyn Bridge. You remember in 94, the boy was shot in the Brooklyn Bridge, Ari Halberstam. His father worked in the Rebbe's house, and he told the Rebbe that his mother is inviting the Rebbe to do the Seder with them in their house on 706 Eastern Parkway. The Rebbe was very thankful and gracious, but he refused them, but he declined. He told him to thank his mother. The Rebbe said he would be doing the Seder himself, and then the Rebbe had a gabai. Rabbi Label Groner of Blessed Memory, and he offered to stay. And the Rebbe said, no, you have a family, go home. And the Rebbe sent everybody home, and he did the Seder all by himself. I was a young boy at the time, about, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old, and it was sad for me, because here was the Lubavitcher Rebbe, considered the most influential Jewish leader of many generations, a person who single-handedly inspired thousands of public Seders around the world, in places like Nepal and Vietnam, Alaska, Los Angeles, Peru, and uh, and, and Tokyo, Japan, for Jews anywhere and everywhere to have a Seder, not to be alone. And here the Rebbe himself was alone at the Seder, literally alone. There was not one other person at his Seder. They prepared the, the, the stuff and the Rebbe was alone at the Seder. And it bothered me. And then years later, I was once sitting with a group of single mothers who did not have husbands because they were divorced or the husbands died. And uh, one of them shared how uh, she was supposed to have her children for Pesach and then her ex in a very mischievous and cruel move took the children the last minute and she was alone at the Seder and she felt that it was so meaningless and worthless and she was looking for comfort. And this was a God sent message. I had an epiphany and I told her, ah, that's why the Rebbe did the Seder alone. A true Jewish leader needs to have his finger on the pulse and needs to make every Jew feel that he's not alone. By the Rebbe doing the Seder alone, he was setting an example. Don't think when you're alone at the Seder that it's meaningless. It's nothing. It's worthless. Because I, tr- I could guarantee you that the Lubavitcher Rebbe Seder alone was a Seder. He left Egypt. God was there. Elio Anavi was there. Moshe Rabbeinu was there. All of Jewish history was there. And I told this woman, don't look at your lonely Seder as worthless. And I think each and every one of us need to learn from this. Like, you know, we look at, you know, that dream Seder. I want that dream Seder. Can I be here and be at that dream Seder? And I say, your Seder is the dream Seder. You know why? Because you're there. You're there, and if you're there, Hashem is there. And if Hashem is there, reality is there. And you know what makes it special? That you're, you're showing up. You're showing up with your tools. 
That's what you're showing. All you have are your tools. You don't have other people's tools. You don't need to have other people's tools. You're showing up with your tools and you're saying, I don't want to be a slave to Pharaoh any longer. Wow, that's big. Wow. Oh, why, why, why? Are you sure you don't want to go for another hour? <laughs> Maybe we could just go straight into the Seder. Go straight into the Seder. We could start early. Okay, well, this has been um, amazingly meaningful. Thank you to all of the Fresh Start alumni for and the Fresh Start family. I know it means the world to us, and I hope it means the world to all of those who joined us tonight from the Fresh Start family just to be together in the room. Or Rabbi Waiwai had this list to go into Pesach with your inspiring words and Dibra Chizuk. I want to wish everybody a wonderful Kasher Freilichen and authentic Pesach. And again, thank you, Rabbi YY, for making time for us. It means the world. I want to I want to thank you, Rabbi Yechenen and Tova and the Fresh Start team for giving me, again, the privilege and the opportunity to address the alumni and address everybody who's joining us, and especially to all those who asked the wonderful questions. And I just want to tell each and every one of you, you know that, trust me, I get lots of letters. There is no say there that is devoid of challenges. There's no say there that is devoid of difficulties, of family quarrels, of family fights, of, you know, somebody wrote me in the comments about mental illness that they have in their family. And it gets crazy at the say there. And somebody wrote to me about a brother and a father who don't talk to each other. And the say there is horrible. And yeah, there are difficulties. Not every say there is perfect. And even the Siddharam that look perfect, trust me, they're far from perfect. And we sometimes wonder, you know, how are we supposed to deal with all of this? And I, and I just want to say, you know, in concluding remarks, and that is leaving Egypt includes two things. It means that I'm in Egypt and then I leave Egypt. If I'm not in Egypt, I can't leave Egypt. If I'm not in Mitzrayim, I can't have Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim. So Pesach includes two things, being in Mitzrayim and then leaving Mitzrayim. So the moment you come to your Seder and you'll identify all the craziness, all the insanity, all the challenges, great, you're a Mitzrayim. You have Mitzrayim. Great, great, wonderful. That's why there's Pesach. <laughs> I want my Seder to look a certain way. No, Pesach is about leaving Egypt. Yes, there's an Egypt happening in your house. Mitzrayim means Mitzar. It's a place of restrictions, of confinements. So when you're seeing all these challenges in your house, all it means is there's a Mitzrayim here. Now we have to leave it. So the fact that we have all these things we have to deal with only tells us that we need to be liberated. That's why we have Pesach. We have Pesach because we're dealing with stuff. If we wouldn't be dealing with stuff, we wouldn't need Pesach. We would just be free souls. So now once you identify the bondage that you're experiencing, now you can pause and you can breathe and you can meditate and you could connect and you can give yourself love and compassion and you can be vulnerable and authentic and you could say and what does it mean for me right now at this moment not to be a slave to this insanity what does it mean maybe it means simply shedding a tear and being kind to your emotions maybe it means telling somebody at the table who you love i am having such a hard time but it's making it easier that I could be with you and hold your hand. Maybe it's turning to God and saying, God, give me the courage to be able to operate with my deepest consciousness of love and authenticity. These are little small gestures, but those are the moments that we literally get out from the grip of Egyptian bondage and what that means in our life. So when you're seeing Mitzrayim, don't get scared. It just means it's time to celebrate Pesach, to go out of Mitzrayim. Great. Give yourself an applause. You found the Mitzrayim. You're not in a delusion, right? You're not part of Egypt because Egypt has denial. Denial is not only a river in Egypt. Denial is denial. <laughs> so now that we liberated ourselves from denial, we can hopefully embark on the Egyptian, on the on the voyage of redemption. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you for the opportunity. I want to bless each and every one of you, and all of our brothers and sisters in Israel and the whole world. At this Pesach, we should each be able to identify the most crippling forces and voices in our lives, stripping us from our authenticity, our emancipation our joy, our creativity, our love, our infinity, 
taking us away from our real deepest relationship with our soul, with Hashem, with each other, with ourselves, and to be able to have the courage to make the decisions we need to make to be able to show up fully, and God should grace each and every one of you with a Pesach in which you can really tell yourself that I showed up with my truth and my authenticity, what that means to me, and to be able to see the results in your life and may it be a Pesach of true redemption and true liberation, especially for all of the hostages and all of the soldiers and all of our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. And may we experience the wonders that we experienced during the exodus of Egypt. And I know this last Mitzray Shabbos, I think we should all mention the fact that April 14th, Saturday night, 2 o'clock a.m., were miracles akin to the miracles of the exodus of Egypt with more than 300 ballistic and cruise missiles from the Haymans of Iran and Persia, ancient Persia, and most of them did not even make it into the space of the Holy Land. And even with the most scientific and technological advancements, if you have it, the system working 90%, that's pretty good. And here that the system was impeccable and flawless i think literally a divine titanic and awesome miracle that we ought to be grateful for and may we see the ultimate miracle of redemption individually and collectively even before pesach amen thank you amen. thank you everybody thank you again for having why why have a wonderful yont of everybody Take thank care. you everybody why, why. wow thank you Chazak. amazing thank you thank you Bye-bye.